one and done, right? Let me try to advance again. So back to that agenda slide. Um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking, um, I shouldn't say most of the time, but um, you'll see uh, we'll first talk about things happening at the state and local level. We'll mix it up a bit and uh, talk first about drug testing updates, um, mostly focusing on marijuana changes, and then we'll move into ban the box, uh, including providing some updates on those that we talked about at our last session in May um, that have, um, that have uh, since um, completed or, or passed. Um, we'll talk about some developments regarding uh, state privacy legislation, and then on the federal side, we'll revisit some of the federal legislation that was pending the last time we talked. We'll cover a few updates regarding um, FCRA case law and then spend a little time on the new FMCSA clearinghouse for uh, employers that have commercial drivers. Um, so that is the agenda, the plan. Moving on into um, new state and local topics. And Jeff, it's not letting me advance. So if you can just move to the next one. Perfect, thank you. Um, I thought since there's a, a fair amount to talk about on drug testing um, that we do a little primer today because I, I think um, people sometimes aren't, um, may not be connecting all the dots um, or understanding all of the different moving parts around drug testing. Um, as you can see, uh, employers that are that are doing drug testing and have drug testing programs, um, you've got a number of things to be thinking about. And that this is just at the law level, by the way. So I'm not even touching here on policy considerations, right? Um, so if you're drug testing, if your employer doing drug testing, um, please have a policy. <laughs> if you don't have one, contact us. We can put you in touch with um, a really great partner um, that can help with drafting policies. Um, but things to be thinking of um, as you are either working on your policy or if you've already implemented it or if you're seeing um, changes, legislative case law changes, um, are how the different laws interact. So um, you've got a number of things happening at the state level, right? Um, mandatory laws are just what they sound like. So those are laws that say, um, if you're a private employer in this state, you're required, if you're gonna do drug testing, um, you're, repri you're required to comply with, comply with this law. So um, some mandatory um, laws require compliance with a reference um, federal SAMHSA or DOT guidelines. Um, others just lay out the specific requirements that employers have to meet. Um, and requirements vary a lot by state, but um, they can cover things like um, what drugs you're allowed to test for, whether or not a lab process is um, allowed, what a legal specimen is um, in that state, um, what the process, whether an MRO process is required or whether a confirm confirmatory test is required. So all of those things, all those topics can be in those mandatory laws. Um, voluntary laws um, also are in, um, enacted in some states. Um, and in the case of a voluntary law, the employer can determine can choose whether or not to comply with the law. So generally, uh, there's some sort of incentive that's built into a voluntary law that, that tells an employer, hey employer, if, you, if your drug testing program um, follows this law, like for instance, maybe um, you might become eligible then for a discount on workers' comp insurance premiums, or you might gain some limited legal protection. But it really is up to the employer to decide whether or not they um, want to comply with that law or not. Um, then there are industry specific laws. So those laws at the state um, would apply only to those specific industries that are regulated by the statute. So um, the most common types of industry specific laws are for things like public works or police officers or um, transportation specific laws. Um, sometimes they even are labeled safety sensitive uh, positions, which can be super confusing um, when employers then start looking at the federal or DOT regulated um, drug testing requirements for safety sensitive positions because um, they may not uh, be defined, that, that term safety sensitive may not mean the same thing uh, between the state law and the federal law. Um, but so, so be looking for that. 
Um, if an employer doesn't have employees that fall under the scope of those industry specific laws, they're not required then to comply with them, right? Um, unemployment compensation denial laws, um, not all states have them, but many have um, some form of an unemployment compensation law and employers are generally um, not required to comply with that law unless they wish to use their drug testing results to de um, deny an unemployment compensation claim. So um, while some, um, some unemployment compensation denial laws don't, ha don't even cover the topic of drug and alcohol testing, others might have specific requirements um, of employers. And so in order to then use um, that drug test as evidence, um, if you want to deny a workers' comp claim, you would have to follow that workers' comp denial law um, in how you um, implement and um, do your drug testing. Um, and I'm sorry, I think I'm, I'm uh, sometimes saying unemployment and sometimes workers' compensation, but um, just know that they are, they're, they're both common. So sometimes there's unemployment and not workers' compensation law. Sometimes there's workers' comp and not unemployment compensation law, but they work similarly. Um, the point just being that um, if you want to use the drug test result um, to either um, deny a comp uh, unemployment compensation um, request or a workers compensation um, request, then you have to follow these laws in how you implement your drug testing program if drug testing is covered under law. And then um, most often discussed lately um, because it is just uh, taking over um, I would say uh, drug test legislation at the state level are medical and recreational marijuana laws. So um, other than, so we'll talk about the federal laws. Um, other than that, all guidance around uh, marijuana use as it relates to employers comes at the state level. So a state could have medical or recreational marijuana law. Each could contain employment provisions or not that impact how you test. Um, they might impact how you can take action based on a test result and, and more. So um, as an employer, you should be taking into consideration any marijuana laws in the state um, in which you operate. And you should know if they contain employment provisions, because that's going to be really important for um, how you use a drug test result, um, what your policy says um, about drug testing and that sort of thing. And then on the federal side, um, we've got a couple of things going on, right? So sort of at a really high level, we've got the Controlled Substances Act. Um, that's the federal statute that regulates the manufacture, distribution of controlled substance like hallucinogens, narcotics, um, depressants, and stimulants. So the act categorizes drugs into um, five classifications or schedules. Um, and that's the schedules are based on their potential for abuse, um, their status sometimes in, in international treaties on any medical benefits that they provide. Um, and then generally speaking, drugs that are in Schedule 1 are the most strict, strictly regulated um, because they're deemed, again, this is under the Controlled Substances Act, to have no medical value. So some examples of the different drug classifications are uh, in that Schedule 1 are LSD, um, ecstasy, heroin. Marijuan, marijuana is currently classified as a Schedule 1 drug under CSA. And then Schedule 2 are things like cocaine, methamphetamine, Schedule 3, anabolic steroids, ketamine, testosterone, Schedule 4. Um, starts to get into some of the more um, the prescription drugs you hear about, Am Ambien, Xanax, Valium. Um, and then Schedule 5. Um, Lyrica, cough suppressants, things like that. So um, you can see where um, there, there's this conflict right now between federal and state law around what is even a controlled substance, right? Um, so if your state law uh, references the drugs that you, perhaps it's a mandatory law, references the drugs that you must test for or that you may test for, um, what is considered a controlled substance um, or if it refers uh, you back to uh, SAMHSA or DOT panels, um, that's going to include marijuana, um, which is sometimes going to then um, be in conflict with what is um, allowed to be tested or 
what the employer can consider in the drug test results for making employment decisions based on state medical and recreational marijuana law. So, and then I threw in case law there just because, oh, sorry, DOT. Um, uh, most employers' experience with um, federally regulated drug testing is around DOT testing for safety-sensitive positions. Um, and um, the, those regulations are uh, very specific, right? Um, they, um, they are mandatory um, drug and alcohol testing guidelines, um, and they define uh, everything from the panel, um, the, the labs that may be um, used to test for the drugs, the process of reporting results from the lab to the MRO, from reporting um, results from um, the MRO to the employer, all of those things are very well defined in the DOT regs. And then case law, um, just a reminder, um, case law becomes um, becomes law, right? It's not. It's not just um, there, there's a, a case, and then that only applies to the the outcome of that case. Only applies to um, the specific facts of that case. Um, in fact, um, the legal decision um, can have the same effect as legislated law. Um, it becomes the precedent. Um, especially state law legal decisions. So um, have a care if you're analyzing or looking at um, just the state laws um, because there might be case law to layer on top of it. So um, thanks for letting me sort of go down that rabbit hole. Um, just I just want to give people, if they haven't thought about it lately, some perspective, um, a reminder on the things they probably should be taking into consideration as they are working on their drug testing policy. So let's move on two yep sorry jeff i think you're gonna have to continue to thanks our first state that we'll talk about today and that's um illinois so illinois um did pass a recreational marijuana law um, it got signed into law by the governor in june it was called the cannabis regulation and tax act um, effective date, well, so this one will go into effect here in January of um, this coming year, so 1 1 2020. It applies to um, Illinois employers and then also applies potentially to uh, employers outside of Illinois that have an employee working in Illinois. Um, so, what, what's, what's required here of employers? Um, just know it's um, employers are still allowed to have a reasonable drug and alcohol test under a workplace drug policy, right? So it, it doesn't say you can't do drug testing um, and doesn't even say that you can't test for marijuana. Um, and it specifically says that employers don't need to accommodate an employee being under the influence or using in the workplace or while performing job duties or while on call. Um, but in order to make an adverse decision based on an employee's um, marijuana use, um, ha they have to um, have a good faith belief that the employee is under the influence. So they're looking for specific articulable symptoms. Um, interestingly, a drug test result, a positive drug test result for marijuana um, was not one of the things that was listed as a, an articulable symptom. Um, so they really are looking for um, um, behavior. And then, um, so, so employers are, are gonna need to think about in, in Illinois, um, in particular, um, um, training, right? So training your employees to recognize um, potential um, drug use, um, somebody who's under the influence at the time when they're at work or performing their job duties. Um, and then the employer also may not discharge or decide not to, hire, not to hire just based on um, an individual's use of a lawful product. So marijuana is now a lawful product um, in Illinois. Next state to talk about um, is Nevada. Uh, Nevada also passed a recreational marijuana law. This was um, AB 132, um, and it amends the, their existing statute. So the amendment is effective 1-1 of 2020. 
um, apply the the new the statute applies to um, pre-employment drug testing and also post-employment drug testing that's happening within 30 days of hire. So that's interesting. I've I've not seen that language before. And the statute says an employer cannot fail to hire based on a positive test for marijuana, although testing for marijuana is still allowed. Um, and it does carve out safety sensitive positions. Um, remember my comment about state law, federal law, um, the state list of safety sensitive positions are firefighters, emergency medical technicians, positions that require operation of motor vehicle for which federal or state law mandates the employee submit to screening, or and specifically positions that in the determination of the employer could adversely affect the safety of others. So much more broad um, than the federal definition of safety sensitive, which is basically individuals um, with a commercial driver's license or that are in positions um, where they're driving. So um, there is a pretty broad carve out there, um, but employers still are going to want to be thinking about who they're drug testing um, and for what um, drugs um, they would potentially make an adverse decision. And then this, this weird um, testing of employees within the first 30 days of employment says the employee, it's because it's now an employee, has the right to submit to an additional screening test at their own expense to rebut the results of the initial screening testing. Um, fairly uh, unfortunate language there, I think. Um, I'm not sure whether submit to an additional screening test means a new collection or a new screen of the original specimen. Um, it's, it's certainly not spelled out um, in the statute. So I think we'll have to wait to see how that one plays out or perhaps we'll have some regulatory um, guidance that'll come out about that. Um, and then just one more note about exceptions. The statute um, does not come uh, does not apply to where you've got um, a contract to an, uh, sorry a contract employment or a collective bargaining agreement um, and it also doesn't apply to positions funded by a federal grant so um, for those of you out there in that um, exception um, you've got a little bit more room in Nevada the third state we'll talk about here is Oklahoma um, Oklahoma passed a medical marijuana um, law, so it was a, the unity bill um, signed into law by their governor on March 14th, um, went into effect here at the end of April. It amends um, an existing law. Um, and so now under the law, employers are prohibited, prohibited from um, refusing to hire or discipline discharge, otherwise penalize an applicant or an employee solely based on the fact that they have, that they're a medical marijuana licensee. So um, just, you know, finding out um, that one of your employees or applicants um, has a medical marijuana license um, is, is not reason um, to take an adverse action in Oklahoma. Um, and then refusing to hire discipline discharge or otherwise penalize an applicant or employee um, based solely on the positive drug test for marijuana is also um, prohibited under this new statute. And the exceptions are um, if the individual that tests or the, if the individual is actually in possession of um, drugs, marijuana um, at work or consumed or was under the influence in the workplace or during work hours. Um, and then also when in a safety sensitive position, again, um, we need, if you have, Oklahoma employees, you're going to be wanting to look at the definition of safety sensitive um, in, in Oklahoma because it may not um, exactly match what um, is allowed or required under federal law. Uh, my next slide here, I, move, I bring back the, the news about New York City. Um, this is just a reminder from the last time because this is a sea change. Um, in New York City, employers actually will not be allowed to include marijuana in their drug testing panel. So um, the city council passed the bill on April 9th. It was not vetoed. And so um, it became law May 10th of this year. There is a one year um, delay in effectiveness. So employers do have a year to get ready for this. Um, but basically it does say employers 
uh, and others who are, are drug testing for an employment purpose may not require a prospective employee to submit to testing for the presence of basically marijuana um, as a condition of employment. So um, this is this is new um, in, in general. Employers have been trying to figure out, okay, how do I comply with these state statutes that say I can't necessarily um, stand alone use a positive marijuana drug test as a, as a reason to take an adverse action. In New York City, um, employers actually will have to exclude uh, marijuana from the panel that they're testing. So thought that was worth um, mentioning one more time. <laughs> And then um, not really related to um, employers and drug testing so much, um, but I, I did wanna just draw our attention back um, to this trend um, because it, it is continuing um, and we should expect to see more. Um, Hawaii, for instance, um, here in this uh, last quarter passed legislation. Um, it did not get vetoed, so um, it becomes law. And basically what they've done is decriminalize possession of small amounts of marijuana. Um, and so that's gonna be in, in Hawaii, in particular effective um, here at the beginning of 2020. Um, as states legalize marijuana, um, legislator, legislators are making this move towards decriminalizing, especially possession for small amounts. We expect this trend to continue. Um, employers, something to think about here um, and so the reason I, I bring it up in this session is if you have uh, criteria for what qualifies or disqualifies an individual from a particular position, if a conviction for possession of a small amount of marijuana would make an applicant ineligible for a position today, do you feel differently if that same possession, if it happened today, wouldn't be considered a criminal act? Um, is that something you need to be revisiting um, in your um, hiring criteria or your uh, individualized assessment um, review process? Is um, does the decriminalization of a case um, make it um, harder for an employer to show um, that there's um, a business necessity um, or that that a conviction is job related if the person was convicted for the same um, offense today, it would not be a criminal conviction, conviction it would just be um, an offense punishable by a fine. Something to think about. So jumping into ban the box at the state level, um, again, for those of you who <laughs> haven't heard me talking about this, this is that effort started as a um, removing the criminal history question from an employment application has broadened to include in some cases restricting when an employer can do the background check and also creating additional obligations for employers, especially usually around the adverse action process. Um, it's sometimes called ban the box, sometimes also called fair chance legislation. Um, Colorado, you may remember from our last session, had passed legislation the last time we talked, but it was pending signature by the governor. Um, in May, the governor did sign, and so Colorado became the 13th state to enact ban-the-box legislation that affects private sector employers, right? There's hundreds of, of laws out there. Um, the vast majority of them affect a state, a county, um, or town employer, um, so like um, public employment. Um, but we are seeing more and more of these of states um, and also local Ban the box legislation that is that that are also implementing um, regulation regulation or statutes that now apply to private sector employers. So Colorado um, is one of those. Um, it applies to uh, most jobs with private employers. There's exceptions for positions um, where the employer is prohibited by law from hiring someone with a specific conviction history, or where they're required by law to conduct a background check. Um, also exceptions for positions. Um, designated by the employer as participating in a government program. Um, the new law bans employers from stating in a job advertisement or on an application form that a person with a record may not apply. Um, the new law also bars employers from inquiring into or requiring disclosure of an applicant's record on an initial application. Um, so still um, pretty early in the hiring process for most employers. And then interestingly, um, 
it um, doesn't regulate the timing of the background report. So um, it says an employer may obtain a publicly available criminal record, background record at any time. Um, so this is a little bit different um, than what we've been seeing lately in Ban the Box or Fair Chance legislation. Um, in many cases, we were seeing language in those statutes that, that would say would limit an employee, an employer from making any inquiry into criminal history um, until a certain amount of time. So this is a little bit different. Um, it doesn't limit when you can do the background check, um, but it does limit when you can ask the consumer or the applicant um, for information about their criminal history. Also, an update in New Mexico. This is one we were watching at our last session. Um, recall that New Mexico already had banned the box legislation from 2010. Um, that one applied only to public or state employment. Um, and as you can see here in April of this year, Governor um, Grisham of uh, New Mexico signed the, um, this, um, this bill into law. And um, it now affects um, uh, private employers as well. So the law prohibits a private employer from inquiring into an applicant's history of arrest or conviction on any written or electronic employment application. Um, it does allow an employer to consider an applicant's criminal history, conviction history, after review of the applicant's application and upon discussion of employment with the applicant. So um, that's... <laughs> That's interesting uh, language, right? Um, oh, I didn't mention it did become effective here in the middle of June. Um, and interestingly, around the definition of who it applies to, um, the law allows applicants or individuals to seek relief by filing a complaint with um, under the Human Rights Act. And the Human Rights Act defines an employer as um, somebody or an entity that employs four or more persons. So um, there's a good chance that um, this law would not apply to employers with less than four employees. And also an update in Maryland. Um, so things went a little bit different here in Maryland. Um, last time we reported uh, that the, the legislation um, had been introduced, it had passed the House of Representatives, but not the General Assembly. Then uh, the legislature had adjourned. Um, it did actually pass then, um, but got vetoed by the governor. So um, an interesting, we don't see this happen a lot lately. Mostly they get passed in some form. Um, interestingly, in Maryland, um, we, we still have uh, local ban the box laws for employers to be thinking about. So Baltimore, city of Baltimore, Montgomery County, Prince George's County um, do have local ban the box legislation. So um, frankly, uh, it might've been a relief for a Maryland employer to have a single statute to comply with, but um, it looks like it, it'll be more of a, um, um, location by location, city by county um, compliance requirement for employers in, in Maryland. And then at the at the local level, uh, mostly we've talked about um, states so far at the local level. Um, we've got uh, Richland County in South Carolina. Um, that ordinance passed on June 7th. It was effective immediately. Um, and that does affect only county employers. So um, county um, counties are no longer uh, allowed to ask about criminal convictions on the job application. Um, they'll only conduct criminal checks after a conditional offer. Um, and um, we're going to talk next. Uh, I have a couple of regulatory updates on Ban the Box, but then we'll move into salary history. Um, it was interesting to see um, this local entity combine Ban the Box with a salary history inquiry band as well, ban as well. Um, on the topic of ban, ban, ban the box, if you're wondering if there's ever any teeth associated with this, these, this legislation and regulation, I wanted to just share information about two locations that recently either announced or shared information about their regulatory activity. Um, we, first, we've got Massachusetts. So this came from the Eternal, at, Attorney General. Um, they made public an investigation of 19 um, businesses that had violated, violated the state's ban the box law. Um, two were fined, 17 were just warned. Uh, a reminder, in Massachusetts, 
um, employers are barred from asking about criminal record or information in the initial job application. So um, employers, if you haven't uh, looked at your employment application lately, um, uh, a reminder to, to, to do that, to take a look, um, to just take that question off of the employment application. Um, I would say potentially even uh, across the country. I, I'm trying to think of any case where I would be as an employer asking that question on the employment application. Um, it's pretty rare not to have some sort of legislation about that. Um, and so moving it to later in your process um, is always going to help you with compliance with these laws. And then we do look at all of these laws to see where in the process you can ask. If you have that question, we have resources um, to, to answer those questions for you. Um, so get in touch with your client success person or me directly if you have questions about the jurisdictions where you're in and when it's okay to ask the questions. Uh, the other um, the other one we, we heard about was uh, the District of Columbia. So um, they provided a uh, news release about their regulatory activity since 2014. Um, it was more than 1,800 complaints. They filed more than 1,100 charges against employers, and they collected a half a million dollars in fines. Um, so that, that's a, a money-making um, activity for the District of Columbia. Um, they, did note, they did note, by the way, that complaints have, been, have reduced year over year, so we are seeing um, compliance there. But again, remember, um, District of Columbia employers to be thinking about if you're going to ask that criminal history question um, to not do it as part of the job application process. Next topic, um, state and local um, salary history man. So as we've discussed last time, this is becoming something of a trend by our count. There's now 17 state laws, 14 local ordinances. Um, New York state um, passed legislation in um, July. It was signed um, by Governor Cuomo. Effective date, here's the beginning of January 2020. And it bars employers from inquiring about salary history. Um, in the application process, employers are not allowed to rely on salary history information if they get it and deciding whether or not to make a job offer. And they may not refuse to hire or retaliate against an applicant that refuses to provide salary history information. Um, so New York employers pay attention to that. New Jersey, uh, the next one, um, was bill was signed um, July of 19, uh, another January 2020 effective date. Employers are prohibited from screening based on salary history. Um, so you can't decide not to give somebody a job based on how much money they've made in the past. Um, you can't require a candidate's past salary history meet some minimum or maximum requirement in order to be considered for the job. Um, and it does include a private right of action. So a, an applicant can bring directly bring a suit against an employer. They don't have to um, complain first to a regulator. Toledo, Ohio, a local um, level ban the box, or sorry, salary history ban. Um, Ordinance was approved by the county in June of this year with an effective date in June of next year. So about a one year delay on that. It applies to Toledo, Ohio employers with 15 or more employees. Um, you're not allowed to ask about salary history of job applicants during the hiring process. You're barred from screening applicants based on prior salary history or requiring, it was actually really similar language. Um, you're not allowed to require a minimum or maximum salary in order to be eligible for the position. Um, you can't rely on salary history um, if, you, if you do receive it in determining whether or not to offer employment, and you can't refuse to hire based on an applicant refusing to provide salary history. Um, some exceptions there. Um, it doesn't apply to action taken by an employer pursuant to a federal, state, or local law that specifically allows reliance on salary history um, or to positions where there's a collective bargaining agreement. Um, you, can, you can use salary history information if you have applicants who, where you're doing an internal transfer promotion or where the applicant um, where you're rehiring somebody that was an employee within the last five years 
if and only if the salary history information was what you previously collected at the time of hire or at the time of the original employment. So a little convoluted. Um, this does, by the way, apply, sorry, back on Toledo, you don't have to go back, but just know Toledo, um, that does apply to public sector employees, not just the city. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri is the next one. Um, they passed, the city council passed their ordinance effective date um, here at the end of Octo October, applies to uh, private employers with six or more employees. Um, they're prohibited from inquiring about past salary history of job applicants. So um, just keep that in mind if you're in Kansas City. That's all I've got for um, salary history ban legislation. Um, a quick note about state and local privacy legislation. Um, last time we talked, um, we were talking a little bit about California, um, how um, other states were um, appeared to be trying to pass state-specific privacy legislation. Um, so far, California is the only one that's really done it. Um, and then we do have a little update here in California. Um, yeah, yep. Um, so the governor actually just um, in September signed an amendment. Um, so the CCPA, so the California um, Consumer Privacy Act, was scheduled to go or is scheduled to be effective 1 1 2020. Um, but the governor gave um, employers um, an extra year to come into compliance around um, information collected about employees. Um, and the um, FCRA exemption, so there was always an FCRA exemption, um, but now it also covers eligibility information. So um, the, the information connect, connected around doing the background check or deciding if somebody is eligible for employment. So um, a little bit of a breather um, for California employers. Um, I'm just looking at the time, so I, I do have, I have some notes on reminders of what um, CCPA um, allows as far as rights for consumers, but I think I will just move on. If you have questions about that, please send an email to your client success partner to me and I will send that out to you. Um, so moving on to some federal topics. Um, I've got EEOC guidance here first. Um, it's, I was a little not sure where to put this because it's actually a state court decision. Um, but just a little um, reminder here about um, the 2012 guidance. Sorry, that's the wrong number. That should say reminder about the 2012 guidance. Um, you might remember, uh, so a number of years ago, um, citing statistics um, that Hispanics and African Americans have arrest and incarceration rates disproportionate to their representation in the general population. The EEOC created and um, um, set out guidance that takes the position that the use of criminal history by an employer has a potentially adverse impact on applicants and employees in these groups. So the guidance said employers use of criminal history information subjects it to liability under Title VII. Um, and that unless the use is job related or consistent with business necessity, um, that it could be problematic or potentially discriminatory. Um, and whether or not it does was hinged on employer's use of sort of procedures detailed in the guidance, um, including a targeted screen and an individualized assessment process. Um, it specifically prohibited the sort of no felony rules or red line um, policies um, that we sometimes hear about. So interesting here, we had a state court decision come out of the state of Texas. Um, the uh, district court for the Northern District of Texas held um, that the EEOC was, so um, this was the state against Equal Opportunity Commission, by the way, so EEOC. The district court said the EEOC was prohibited from enforcing the guidance against the state, so specifically against the state, because it failed to comply with the Federal Administrative Procedures Act, which requires a notice and comment period uh, before a regulatory agents, agency um, can proliferate or uh, can put out guidance. Um, both parties appealed. The Fifth Circuit heard it and they held 
um, that guidance is a substantive rule and that the EOC actually lacks the power to promulgate guidance regardless of the notice and comment requirements. So uh, they went even further um, than um, Texas had gone in their argument. So they upheld the district court's injunction there um, and expanded. They said um, the EOC and the Attorney General are prohibited from treating the guidance as binding in any respect. Um, so it's a little bit stunning. Um, We'll see how this plays out. Um, it could, you know, it, it could provide a solid basis for challenging the guidance. Um, keeping in mind, though, that this particular, the facts of this case were a state against the EEOC. So um, it's it's less clear um, whether or not um, the guidance or there, there would be a similar holding um, from a private employer. Um, but a very interesting development um, in EEOC and the um, authority that courts give to that EEOC guidance from 2012. Um, so we'll see how um, that develops here as, as potentially we have more cases about it. An interesting development in FCRA, um, I, I bring this one up just because um, the class was so huge. You might, you guys might remember um, Petrie versus Walmart. Walmart. This was an FCRA um, case. Um, the the allegations were that um, Walmart had included extraneous language um, in their disclosure and authorization process. Um, and in January, um, the court had certified a class of 6.5 million. Um, so just uh, incredibly large. You can imagine what um, sort of settlement or what, um, what kind of payout Walmart might have been looking for when you consider that um, FCRA, just the statutory violations, um, not any other additional um, penalties that can be assessed, but just the statutory violations are 100 to to $1,000 per violation. So multiply that by 6.5 million. That's what Walmart was looking at. They did appeal. And the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California decertified the class. So this is just sort of hot off the presses. This is in the last week. Um, and remanded it back to state court. They said, they cited Spokio. So we've talked about Spokio before. That was um, the Supreme Court case on the question of um, whether uh, there's a concrete injury in these sort of FCRA bare procedural violations, um, and they cited Spokio in their opinion. So um, good news for employers, um, and um, I'm hopeful we'll continue to see uh, those cases get decertified. Um, I believe this was remanded to state court, so there could still be um, state law cause of action there that could come back, but um, we'll see. And then just a few more, I've got a couple more updates on some of the federal stuff we talked about last time. Um, fair, chance ban, uh, fair chance legislation at the federal level. So this was um, passed by the House in July um, and it would require um, federal government employer and federal contracts employers to postpone asking the question about criminal history until after a conditional offer with exceptions, right? The usual exceptions. Um, the Senate, amendment passed in a committee before September recess. So far, it hasn't been taken back up. So I think um, I, I think it's a little likely given what's going on uh, in Washington um, that, that the Senate will take this back up this year, um, but they could surprise me. Um, in general, there seems to be um, a lot of support for it. I think it might just be a matter of whether um, there will be time for it to get passed, um, whether they'll be, they will make time on an agenda. Um, also from, from the, the past, last session, there was a lot of talk earlier in the spring about national privacy legislation. Um, also seems to me to be losing steam for the year. I think it's unlikely we'll see um, any bill gain enough momentum to actually pass this year, but we'll keep tracking it. Um, sort of stalled after the summer recess. They were they were working on it during the recess, but again, I just think with everything that's going on um, here uh, in DC, that it'll be hard for this to make it to the top of any agenda. 
And then um, just quick here, uh, a reminder, I think we've talked about this before. I know certainly for our um, clients, we've been sending out communications about this for our DOT regulated employers. Um, we have a new clearinghouse. So um, the FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier um, Administration, not FMCSS, Oof. FMCSA's um, um, new clearinghouse is coming. Uh, so this is coming out of a 2017 regulation change. Um, it established a clearinghouse. Um, the idea is that um, it would be records, um, a way to create a single database about violations of drug and alcohol testing programs. Um, the compliance date in that 2000 regulation change is January of 2020. Um, so it's coming up fast. Um, it will require uh, medical review officers, substance abuse professionals at SAPS, some third-party administrators or, or consortia, and some other service agents to report to the clearinghouse information that's related to violations of drug and alcohol um, regulation 49 part 40 um, for current and prospective employees. So um, employers then will be required to query the, query the clearinghouse for current and prospective employees drug and alcohol violations before permitting um, those employees to operate a commercial motor vehicle. And also regulated employers will have to annually query the clearinghouse for each driver they currently employ. Uh, and then state driver's license authorities or agencies also have to query the clearinghouse whenever a CDL is issued, renewed, transferred, or upgraded. So um, the idea, idea being here to stop drivers from hiding um, their FMCSA uh, drug and alcohol um, violation history um, just by simply moving from one employer to another employer. Um, Note, so for, F for FMCSA employers, you know you already have this obligation to contact past employers um, where your, your new hire was in a regulated position. Um, that obligation does not go away um, until three years after the clearinghouse is established and um, is in use. So um, for the first three years of this FMCSA clearinghouse program, employers still need to do that verification um, that's required under the FMCSA regs by contacting the employers directly, the past employers directly. Um, and uh, then after three years, um, employers will be able to, to go only to the FMCSA. So that obligation to contact past employers will go away. Um, also note, this is not intended and won't replace the DOT regulated um, requirement of contacting um, past employers. So um, still have to contact employers um, but only to ask them the, the questions that are required under DOT regs, you will no longer have to ask the past employers um, the questions that are required under FMCSA regs. Um, and I just, so again, hot off the presses, um, to this morning I received an email from the clearinghouse um, where they announced that registration is open. So if you're an FMCSA regulated employer, I encourage you um, to get that process started. Um, the FMCSA has stated that once an employer is registered in the clearinghouse, they can authorize service agents to conduct queries of the clearinghouse on their behalf. Um, and so this is the, the part of the service that Orange Tree can help you with. Um, so once you're registered, please get in touch with us so we can do our part there. Um, we'll also be, of course, actively reaching out to our DOT regulated clients to provide information regarding how to get that set up um, and the costs associated with the new service. So um, continue to look for communication with us from us, um, clients especially, on uh, getting that clearinghouse process set up. And that's my, my last slide. Um, as you can see, uh, my direct contact information is right there on the slide. Do feel free to, to reach out. Um, our marketing team also uh, will reach out with communication. Um, Jeff, did you have any final thoughts? I have a question, Heidi. It, it seems to me that maybe we just ran out of time, but there should have been a part of your presentation that talks about the legislation that softens, lessens the burden of you know, obligations of employers to providing you know, and having to deal with non-negligent hiring. So it certainly seems like everything is uh, 
making it more and more difficult, uh, tedious. Certainly, there, there's a lot of additional legislation and laws that they need to be aware of. So I, I really appreciate you taking us through this today. I know we're right at kind of the end of our time. We'd like to, to get everyone back to, together on their schedule. We apologize for, or I apologize for my, my slightly a hint of a sarcasm with my question about that particular <laughs> legislation that I hope to see next week or next month, next time that we do this. In the meantime, I, I guess it really does underscore our business, our focus, really several fold, but not the least of which one, the, the, the role that you play in our organization, compliance, the communications that we, on a regular basis, make available to our, to our clients, to those that are, are interacting with us. The, the fact that we host this webinar at least uh, quarterly and, and then finally, the, the continuous monitoring and product for criminal activity because there's just there are less and less it seems that an employer can discover up front. So we're, we're here to help you, our clients, and, and those of you who join as prospects, we'd, we'd sure love to engage in additional conversations to see how we might be able to help you. So looking at the, the board here, I, I don't think we have any additional questions. We are at time, so I will thank you. For joining today's webinar, there is the contact information that's available on this chart, and we will make the deck as well as a recording of today's webinar available, if not by end of day today, uh, first thing tomorrow morning for everyone's uh, review again in the future. So with that, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, Jeff.